goodness. It's good to be back with you again. Thank you for, for praying for our family last week and for all those who stepped up in leadership last week, for the youth that testified, and, and uh, for, for Steve that preached, and, and for all who, who were part of that. Thank you. And man, it was uh, great to watch the videos this, this week of, of last week's uh, service and, and to get a glimpse of what was going on. Thank you also for praying for us as we made our way to Atlanta and back uh, without losing our salvation, which is a whole other doctrinal thing for another day. But, uh, but the idea of, of dropping our baby girl off and it'd be one thing for her to fly to another part of the country, but no, she had to fly to another country and to another hemisphere, for goodness sake. She uh, made her way safe and sound to New Zealand with our campus ministry group and uh, school starts Tomorrow for us, today for her. She's 16 hours ahead of us there. And uh, and so they are preparing to, to minister on the college campus there in Osaka or something like that, in somewhere in New Zealand. But, uh, she's, she's there. She's had a good uh, first orientation week, first few days. I've been a little homesick. I would love to say that because she misses her daddy. But there's this other man in her life now that I think she misses more than her dad and uh, again that's a sermon for another day so, uh, <laughs> but she's doing well and her team is ready to anxious to to get going I want to start today uh, for those of you uh, that may I, I know there's some first time guests with us today and there's, there's some others that haven't been in a while uh, we've been in Exodus uh, for a week or two and uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And this is this is episode number forty-seven today. Episode forty-seven, uh, our forty-seventh sermon in, in Exodus, and, and uh, we're into chapter thirty-two, and we're in the home stretch. There's only two sermons left after today, uh, and uh, some of you are rejoicing over that. Some of you are, are disappointed in that, and I appreciate all of you that are disappointed. In that it's been a fabulous, fabulous uh, walk through and journey through this great gospel of the Old Testament. So I, I want to invite you to go ahead and turn there today, but I want to begin with this quote. Jess, go throw it up on the screen for me. How quickly we forget God's deliverances in our lives. How easily we take for granted the miracles He performed in our past. Well, let's, let's think about that for a second. How quickly we forget God's great deliverances in our life. We sing a song today called Great is Thy Faithfulness. We sing songs today that you are faithful. What does that mean? How do we know that God is faithful? How do we know that for certain? We have to look back and see that He's been faithful before, right? We see that He is faithful because He proclaims Himself as faithful. He's coming again in Revelation 19 on a white horse with the name faithful and true right there. And so we know that God is faithful as we look back, as we look in, as we look ahead. But there's something about this human nature of ours that even though we know God is faithful, we know God is who He says He is, it's easy to forget how quick we are to forget how long would you say that it takes to forget God's great deliverances in our lives? How long does it take? Sometimes we leave the church and before we even unlock our car, we forget God's great deliverances in our lives. Before we get to the restaurant, before we get home, before we get into Monday, for goodness sake, we have already forgotten what we have heard, what we have learned, what we have taken in for the day. If God is faithful, then we are to sing and to praise and to worship a God who is who He says He is. How easily, the, the author says, how easily we take for granted the miracles He's performed in the past. Wow. I want to point out to you a scripture today. It's uh, by a, a psalm writer. We're not 100% certain who wrote it, but in Psalm 106, we see this this great remembrance of sorts. And the psalm writer says this, we have sinned like our fathers. He's talking to his modern day audience. We've sinned like our fathers. Have we committed iniquity and we've behaved wickedly? And then he goes on to remember the past. He says in verse 7, our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember your abundant kindnesses, but rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. And we've explored this. Nevertheless, he saved them. Why? Why did he save them? Read it with me. For the sake of His name. Not because they were stronger. Not because they were prettier. Not because they were more fit. Not because they deserved it in any way. He saved them for the sake of His name so that He might make His power known. Thus, 
He rebuked the Red Sea and it dried up. It has to. When God says dry up, it's just got to dry up. And He led them through the deeps as through the wilderness. So He saved them from the hand of the one who hated them, that be Pharaoh, and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. The waters covered their adversaries. Not one of them was left. And you remember the song of praise that they sing in Exodus chapter 15. Exodus 14 begins with fear and it begins with the fame of God being proclaimed to the earth because this story is still told up to this day. Although I did watch the, the History Channel this week and they're trying to make it a lake of sea reeds up about 20 miles north of this. Anyway, you just can't watch that liberal TV very much. But you get to the place where you hear in Exodus 15, they themselves walk through on dry ground. Their adversaries are consumed. Not one of them is left. And it says they believed His words and they sang His praise. Which you would have to, right? After you just saw something like that, you couldn't help but believe His words and to sing His praise. That's just what happens. You believe that God is faithful, so you sing that He is faithful. You believe that God is just, so you sing that He is just. You believe in His grace, and so we sing of His great grace and His mercy. Interestingly enough, the psalm writer doesn't make any transition. He doesn't use a conjunction word. He doesn't use any other thing to tie them together. He goes from believed his words, they sang his praise, to verse 13, they quickly forgot. They quickly forgot his words. How long does it take to forget the miracles and the performances and the provision and the protection and the acts and the mercy and the salvation of God. How quick are we to forget? For them it took less than a week because they came through that sea and got thirsty and hungry. And here comes all the grumbling, all the complaining, all the, it's not going my way. This is not what we were expecting quickly forgot His words. Now, the last few weeks we've been eavesdropping uh, of sorts on the instructions that God has given to Moses, the Ten Commandments, the, the instructions of the temple, what the priest was going to wear, what the temple was, or the, the, the tabernacle, what it was going to look like, and how Israel's worship, how they were going to connect to God, and how they were going to interact with each other. Today's story is an interruption of that narrative. Today's story is a Meanwhile, back in the foot of the mountain, meanwhile, back in the camp, what in the world is going on? Forty days have transpired since Moses has ascended to the top of the mountain. Remember, this is the mountain that had quaked. This is the mountain that is building a furnace of smoke up into the sky as God's revelation, as God's presence has descended on the top of the mountain. It's just God and Moses. We're going to hear next week one of the most beautiful parts of Scripture that you can ever hope to imagine that God speaks with Moses face to face. As a friend would a friend. This is the type of interaction that's going on on the top of the mountain. Despite all the thunder and the lightning and the quaking and the smoke and the fire and everything else. God's presence is now on the mountain. And He is speaking to Moses. And at the foot of the mountain, the natives have grown restless. In just 40 days. They have quickly forgotten His works. They did not or will not heed His counsel. And they will take matters into their own hands. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Here's a be careful though. A beware for us today. Beware. Don't get your pointy little self-righteous finger out and point it back in time to these Israelites. Because at the end of the sermon, there's going to be a spiritual mirror of sorts that as we point back, we're going to be looking into a mirror and saying, you know what? Not much has changed in the last 4,000 years. Amen, Not much. So be careful and beware that we don't get a little too far ahead of ourselves. Today in Exodus chapter 32, the title of today's sermon is The Ingredients of for idolatry, the ingredients for idolatry, because there's something that is happening, that, that something that is corrupting, something that is that is distracting, something that is lying, something that is trying to gain our attention of sorts in this. And so what I want to do today is, is I'm just going to read 
this, the text. I want to read the story to you. It'll take a few minutes to read all the verses, all right? And I just want to lay it out there so you can see the story. Some of you, this is very familiar to you, but there'll be pieces of it that you may not quite remember. So I just want to go ahead and get it on the record, all right? This is where we're headed. Stand with me, if you would, in honor of reading God's Word aloud together. And if you're in here today without a copy of God's Word, we're going to be reading a lot. So David Bright's down here. He's going to pick up a Bible. He's going to hold it up in his hand like this, Brother Steve. If you came in today without a copy of God's Word, I want you to see this, all right? We'll turn to you. We'll make sure you get a copy because I want to make sure that you see what you can see, all right? Anybody else need one? We'll bring it to you. Just raise your hand. All good? You can, everybody can see it. Exodus chapter 32. You're already looking into the end. Of the 35 verses. I'm going to be... Falling apart by that. No, no, no. We'll, we'll, I'll let you sit down in just a second. Verse 1. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, remember he'd been up for 40 days, the people assembled about Aaron, his brother, and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, dude, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. And all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And Aaron took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into what church? A molten or golden calf. Yeah. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he then built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. So the next day they rose early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. The Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once, for your people who you brought from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and said, This is your God. In verse 9, the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate people. I mean, King James fans do I have in the house, or ESV, a stiff-necked people. What's a stiff-necked person? The stiff-necked person is like that cow that will refuse to bow his head and put the yoke on. He doesn't want to work. He doesn't want to serve. He doesn't want to remain. He doesn't want to abide. He just wants to go, move, <laughs> run away. Okay? Move to the Greek there if you didn't get that. All right. So the, he says, I have seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate people that refuse to bow. Now in verse 10, then, now let me alone, that my anger may burn against them, that I may destroy them, and I will make of you, Moses, a great nation. Then Moses entreated the Lord as God and said, O oh Lord, why does your anger burn against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak, saying, with evil intent he brought them out, to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn, Lord, from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens. And all this land of which I have spoken, I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. This is Moses' prayer. And the Lord, in verse 14, changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. Thank you. You may be seated. Keep your text open. We're going to continue on. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand. That's the Ten Commandments. Tablets which were written on both sides, that they were written in one side and on the other. And the tablets were God's work. And the writing was God's writing, engraved on the tablets. Now when Joshua, the assistant to Moses, heard the sound of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there's a sound of war in the camp. But Moses said, it's not the sound of the cry of triumph, nor is it the sound of the cry of defeat. It's the sound of singing that I hear. And it came about as soon as Moses came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger burned, and he threw the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf which they had made and burned with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it over the surface of the water and made the sons of Israel drink it. And Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you that you have brought such great sin upon them? Aaron said, Do not let the anger of my Lord burn. You know the people yourself that they are prone to evil. For they said to me, Make a God for us who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. 
And I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into this fire, and out came this cat. <laughs> Now, when Moses saw that the people were out of control, for Aaron let them get out of control to be a derision among their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered to him. He said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Every man of you put his sword upon his thigh and go back and forth from gate to gate in the camp and kill every man his brother and every man his friend and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did as Moses instructed and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Then Moses said, Dedicate yourselves today to the Lord for every man has been against his son and against his brother in order that he may bestow a blessing upon you today. On the next day, Moses said to the people, You yourselves have committed a great sin, and now I am going up to the Lord, back up the mountain. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has committed a great sin, and they have made a god of gold for themselves. But now if, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out from your book which you have written. He's going a long way, as he folks. The Lord said to Moses, Whoever sinned against me, I will blot him out from my book. But go now, lead the people where I told you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I punish, I will punish them for their sin. And the Lord smote the people because of what they did with the calf which Aaron had made. What a story, huh? What a story. I mean, there's, there's laughter, there's tears, there's... there's there's reasons to mock. There's reasons to cry. There's, there's, there's reasons, all kinds of reasons to try to figure out what in the world is going on in this place. Big difference between the top of the mountain and the foot of the mountain. Today, as we talk about the ingredients for idolatry, I want to first define the term for you so we can lay a foundation for where we're headed in our teaching. Idolatry can be defined. If you've got your sermon notes out, and you should have been handed some sermon notes when you walked in the door today. If you need something to write with, raise your hand and we'll bring you a pen uh, or make sure that you've got something. But the notes will help us. Maybe it helps be our guide today for, for, for where we're headed. All right? Idolatry can be defined in one of three ways. The first bullet point is this. Putting something or someone in the place of God. All right? You can fill that in your blank today. Putting something or someone in the place of God. God has said in His Word, commandment number one, you shall have what? No other gods before me. So anything that's before him would be a god. It would be another idol. It would be something that would be wrong for them to do. The second one is trusting in that something or that someone else to bring ultimate fulfillment or satisfaction in your life. What do you find that is going to fill you? Satisfy you to make you content. Trusting in something or someone else. And then the third is a desire for created things eclipses our desire for God. Desire for the created things become more important to us than God Himself. Now, I talked to you about these ingredients. There are certain things that exist before and during and, and after that, that are an indicator that idolatry is rampant in our lives or idolatry is a problem in our life. And the first one is this, and we see this in verse 1 of our text. The first one is doubt. They don't even know what has happened to Moses, and they're saying, man, it's been 40 days, we don't know what's happened to this guy. There's doubt in Moses, and now there's doubt in God. And doubt always leads us to take things in our own hands, doesn't it? It does, because when we doubt in the veracity of something else or the truth of something else, then we got to substitute. And usually we do a very poor job of that. The second ingredient is restlessness. Restlessness. What's been going on for 40 days? They've been left to themselves to try to figure out what they're going to do, right? No, God's already given them His Word. Moses has already spoken the words of the commandments and all those sundry laws that we looked at. There's a restlessness in the camp. There's a discontent with the current situation. Nothing has improved and nothing has changed. Number three, forgetfulness. We've talked about this. The good life calls to no desperate prayers or pleas. When things are good, we tend to forget. Number four is disobedience. 
It's a rejection of the Word. James 4.17 gives us a definition of sin. For the one who knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it, that's sin. All right? To know what is right and not to do it is to reject the Word. They have already received the Word of God. They know that they shouldn't have any other gods. There should be no other graven images. There should be no other name. And here they are. Commandment number one. Commandment number two. Commandment number three. Completely destroyed. Among others. Because as we said when we looked at the Ten Commandments, when you mess up the first one, the rest of them fall like dominoes, don't they? Number five is pride. This is the root to all sin. It's the exaltation of self. When self is exalted above God, there's no room for God. In our biblical counseling, oftentimes we'll write or, or put a throne on the little whiteboard there and we'll say, all right, who's calling the shots? Who gets to call the shots in your world, in your life? Everybody wants a Savior, but not everybody wants the Lord, a boss, a master. And when you exalt yourself to first place, there's no other room for God. Now, it's tempting. And I told this first service today, it's tempting to pause right here and to ask the question, what's the matter with you people? Right? Remember, I told you, don't do that. But you can't help but think, they've just been through the sea, for goodness sake. Are they hungry? Then just walk outside your tent. There's bread on the ground for you. Are you thirsty? Look, there's a big rock over there with water gushing out of it to quench your thirst. Are you hot and weary? Look at that sky. No, there's a pillar of cloud there that is providing shade for you. Are you afraid of the dark? There's a pillar of cloud, a fire by night that helps guides and directs and brings light into your darkness. God has provided all of these things for you. The plunder of Egypt is in your ears. The bread of heaven is in your belly. What's the matter with you people? Don't you want to ask that? I do. I have been all week. Man, what a bummer it is to have that turn around back into my face. <laughs> What's the matter with you, Rouse? I was faithful then. I'm faithful today. You know I'm going to be faithful forevermore. Why are you fretting over this? Why are you struggling over this? Why do you keep running back to that? Man, it's easy. What are these people doing? In our text, in verse 8, it says that they quickly turned aside. They quickly turned aside. They have forgotten His works. They're not heeding His counsel. They've quickly turned out aside. In verse 25, it says, they are out of control. Many of you know this proverb, where there is no vision, the people what? Perish, right? That's the King James. But a, a, a better translation is where there is no vision, where there's no structure, where there's no leadership, the people cast off what? Restraint. They don't want to be tied in. They don't want to be restricted. They don't want to be restrained. And when there is no godly leadership, the people are going to run crazy. Sally's class, y'all just finished Judges. What can keep recurring demon Judges? Remember? People did what was right in their own eyes. For sure. Where there is no vision, where there is no leadership, the people cast off restraint. That's exactly what's going on here. God's provision is clearly not enough for them. His presence, His actions, His salvation, His protection. No, they've adulterated themselves. They have prostituted themselves against God. It's exactly what's happened. It would be the same thing for us to stand up here today in a wedding ceremony, make our vows and our pledges to one another, and then commit adultery on our honeymoon. That quick. They forgot His works. He was not enough for them. Forty days ago, in seven chapters in our text ago, they made this pledge. All that the Lord has commanded, we will do it. We will obey it. All that the Lord has commanded, we will do. Forty days later. Who is God? They quickly forgot. The man of God is on the mount of God. In the presence of God, receiving the Word of God, and the people are going nuts at the bottom of the mountain. How the separation is. Do you realize that just 7,000 feet from the presence to the prostitution? How quickly we forget. How quickly we turn aside. I find it pretty ironic that on the top of the mountain, it was told in between services, 7,500 feet. 7,500 feet there. The finger of God is inscribing the law of God in His stone. Right? At the foot of the mountain. 
than breaking it as fast as he ever it. Look in your spiritual mirror today. Get this that self-righteous finger back and make it turn around. Here we are. Not much has changed in 4,000 years, has it? Breaking the law as fast as he can ride it. And where's Aaron here? Where is he? <laughs> He's right there. I, I forgot to, to put the words on this PowerPoint slide, but in your notes, there's two blanks. He's appeasing and he's compromising. That's what he's doing. He's appeasing the people. He's giving in to the people and giving in to their wants and their wishes, and he's compromising with them. He's now become not the, the leader of worship of Yahweh. He is now the worship leader of blasphemy and idolatry, leading them to say, even this is your God, O Israel. And they burn a sacrifice. Interestingly enough, the burnt sacrifice is a sacrifice for sin, and there's a peace offering that comes with it. <laughs> You're in the middle of violating God's law and trying to make peace at the same time. Just doesn't make sense, does it? Who are we to think that we can ask and we can pray to God, Lord, bless me, bring your favor upon me, help me get that job, help me get that spouse, help me help my children, help me, help me, give me, give me, all these things we ask of God. In the meantime, it's breaking His law one right after the other every single day. You want peace with God and to break His law at the same time? Not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. And there He is, right there in front of them, leading them into blasphemy and idolatry. Now, the calf itself is interesting enough, and, and the image is significant. We don't, we don't lose the significance of it. They've torn off all their, their gold earrings, all the plunder of Egypt, and he's fashioned it in verse 4. He's fashioned it with the graving tool after he's melted it all in and, and got it all softened where he could shape it and mold it. Why a calf? <clears throat> you ever ask yourself this? He could have built anything. He could have molded and shaped this thing into anything. Why a cat? It's the, the reason why this is significant is because they're just a few months removed from Egypt. And the god Apis, A-P-I-S, is a manifestation of Ta, P-T-A-H. You don't have to remember those, all right? But they was the chief creator god of Egypt. The people in verse 1 are demanding, they come opposing Aaron, and they come demanding a God who will go before us. And interestingly enough, they take all the, the plunder of Egypt out of their ears, they melt it down, and they make a God that they're familiar with. Uh oh. You see that? A God that they're familiar with. Most oftentimes, we're not going to go to some strange store and buy a little Buddha and put it on top of our mantle and bow down in front of it. We don't do that. Why? Because we are foreign to us. But let, let's, let's get real and let's look at the things that we do hold up in esteem. We're not going to call names. We're not going to make any lists or anything like that today. But you know what's... You know what gets in the way. You know what comes first in your life. You know the thing or the one who has ascended to first place in your life. And you want God to bless you, but you refuse to forsake idolatry. You refuse to, to do what you have been commanded to do. In verse 4, Aaron fashions it. In, in verse 8, it says that he made it, and then they worshiped it, and they sacrificed to it. The same God who was completely humiliated and utterly destroyed, I hope you'll get that in a second, but by Yahweh early on, in front of their very eyes, they're now fashioning this God. It's something that they're familiar with. Giving evidence that the people's hearts still crave Egypt more than Yahweh. What do you still crave more than God? Do you come from a past life? Many of you in here today would say, yeah, man, I have... I've made my confession, my profession to the Lord. I'm, I'm trying to live the best Christian life I can today. And I'm doing best. But are there still things that you still crave in your Egypt? You still keep going back to? You see how nothing is new? Not much has changed? You know what they are. What do the people want here? They want what they've always wanted. They want something else. They want something else. They're not willing to listen and to buy into the truth of God. They want something else beside God. This is what Paul says in Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 
He says, the time will come. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have what? Their ears tickled. They will accumulate for themselves teachers and courts to their own desires. They will turn away from the truth. They will turn aside to myths. It's what we've always wanted. Thousands of years separate Exodus 32 and 2 Timothy 4. Thousands of years separate 2 Timothy 4 and 2019. And we're still struggling with the same thing. Something, someone, some teaching, something else besides God. I want glory without the cross. Really. I want heaven without the struggle and the suffering and the persecution. That's what I really want. Something else to leave me there. It says in verse 6 that they sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That word play, the original language, gives me an idea that there's sexual overtones in that. That there's a wild party going on, there's carousing going on, there's drunkenness going on, there's sexual orgies going on, there's all kinds of, 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 of horrible things going on at the foot of the mountain. They can see the top of the mountain. The smoke but they can see the manifest presence of God up on the mountain, knowing what's going on, and still, still will build an idol and will sacrifice to it and worship it. What are they thinking? They're the fools of Romans 1, aren't they? The great exchange of Romans 1, they changed the truth of God for a lie and worship and served the creature more than the creator. That's the fool of Romans 1. So what's this story really all about? Fill this in your blank today and write it in bold words and go over it a few times. The story is really about rebellion today. And this is the ingredients of idolatry are a, it's a, it's a symbol of something that's inside of us already. It's that raised fist to heaven and you can't boss me around. I don't want that. I don't want you. I don't want this circumstance. I don't want this situation. I want only what I want. Now, that took a while, so let's go quickly. Look at verse 7. God's response to the rebellion. What is God's response to the rebellion? He's got some serious righteous anger going on, as well as He should. It's deserving. He has poured out Himself to the people. He's explained to the people. But look what He says in verse 7. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. God's ready to give them over. Right? He says they're an obstinate, stiff-necked, prideful, stubborn people. And it says in verse 10, He's ready to destroy them. To destroy this group and start all over with Moses. God's done this before with Noah. We'll do it again. Moses' response to God, we find in the next few verses, Moses responds with a desperate prayer. It says in, in verse 11 that he entreated the Lord. This is a pleading to the Lord, a, a, an urging, a, a begging of sorts to the Lord. It said, O oh Lord, why does your anger burn against your people who you brought out from the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? What's Moses doing here? He's reminding God of his deliverance. He's reminding God of his deliverance. And right out beside the word deliverance, I want you to write the phrase, what God has done. Right? Deliverance. What God has done. What is Moses praying here? Moses is looking back. He's remembering you know, He's remembering himself and reminding God, look at the power and the might of which you brought your people out. The second prayer is in verse 12. Why should the Egyptians speak saying with evil intent he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and destroy them from the face of the earth? He's reminding God of his reputation here. And outside of reputation, this is who God is. What a great recipe for prayer. If you're wondering, well, how should I pray? What are the things that I should pray? Start right here. In verse 11, we learn that when we pray, we can remind God, and we can remind ourselves in doing so, who God is and what God has done. He is who He says He is. He'll do what He says He can do. He did it once, He'll do it again, and He will forever be. Thirdly, in verse 13, He says, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Israel, your servants to whom you swore by yourself. He's reminding God of His covenant. And outside covenant, you can write in what God has said. What God has said. When you pray, remember what God has done. Look back at His salvation, His deliverance. When you pray, remind God of His reputation. Remember who God is. 
then when you pray, remember what God's Word says. It's so important. God responds to Moses' prayer. It says in verse 14, So the Lord changed His mind about the harm which He would do to His people. I'm going to take a two-minute rabbit trail here. So, so bear with me. You don't have to remember everything. But when it says that the Lord changed His mind, I want you to be careful with something. There is no situation or circumstance in this world that's going to confuse or surprise or trip up the Lord. There is no genius in the world that can conspire with God and get God to say, hey, you're right, I like it better your way. There's nothing there. So when it says in the text, it literally jumps off the page to the Lord changed His mind. It gives us the idea that because of Moses' good prayer, God says, all right, I'll relent and not destroy him. What is up with Moses in his praying? What is up with Moses in his prayer? Is there anything special about that? No, God's doing something different here. And, and I keep telling you this all the time. Never just read a Bible verse. Okay? I know it's awkward for a preacher for you to hear a preacher say, don't read a Bible verse. I'm just talking about don't get that one verse, pull it and yank it out of its context, and then go, well, there he is. That's who God is. Because if you do that, you can clearly look at that and say, it says right there the Lord changed his mind. So the Lord can change his mind once, maybe he'll change his mind again. So I'm going to start praying for that. You know, that better house, that better job, and that better car. Maybe the Lord will change his mind about my current circumstances and get me out of that old beater out there and maybe put me into something else that I like. That's, that's not the case, and that's not the character of God. You've got to look at the context before, in the middle, and after. Who God is, what God has said, what His covenant is, what His purpose is. Do you really think that it is the intent of the Lord to wipe out the entire people that He has called to Himself? No, but God, God's doing something in... Moses is what he's doing. That's where he's after. 33 times. 33 times in the Old Testament the words repent or relent are used in relation to God. In Genesis, around the time of Noah, it said the Lord was sorry he had made man. The King James says that he's repented. Alright? He repented that he had made man. He was sorry. But in Numbers, it says God's not a man that he should lie. Or son of man, he should repent. 33 times these words. And so the Bible seems to be confusing here. It seems to contradict itself. But there's something that you need to know about this. Because when you study the Scripture, there's a strain. There's a line that runs from beginning to end that connects us from one end to the other through the Gospel. That helps us know who God is. And the great divine author wants us to know Him. And He, he uses language that helps us with that. All right? You don't have to write this word down. It's a million dollar word for the day. You don't even have to remember it when you leave. But the word is called anthropomorphic language. Right? How many of you had to study anthropology in college? Anybody had to study that? Good. A few of you? That's the study of humanity, right? The study of humankind. The study of man. And what they're like. And what, they're, what their nature is like. Okay? Anthropomorphic language includes words. The divine author says that God has a right hand, a strong arm, the eyes of God are towards the righteous, the ears of God are open to their cry. He has a mind, he has a heart, the earth is his footstool. What is the divine author saying about himself? He's giving us a, a, an idea of how to understand and how to work with him and how to, how to clue into what he's saying, being made in his image. But God's the Spirit. He doesn't have arms and hands or feet or eyes or ears or anything like that. Not literally a physical body. And God says that He's changing His mind here. It's not the way we think of changing your mind. I'm going to walk over there and I'm going to smack Steve Olin right away. I'm going to do it. And then Steve stands up and pulls a big stick out of somewhere and I go, change my mind. <laughs> There's a better idea that's come alongside, right? So, sorry for the rabbit trail, but I want to make sure you get this, all right? There's a doctrine of, of theology called immutability. And that, that's what we're talking about. God doesn't change. Hebrews says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So we have to understand that about Him. But He is changing Moses. Isn't He? Have you noticed the change in Moses' character at this point? In Genesis chapter 3 at the burning bush, Moses is questioning God's reputation and he's refusing to go back to rescue this obstinate people. Here in Exodus 32, he's not defending God's reputation and now he's willing to die for the people. 
God's working something here. And God is now shaping Moses to be the intercessor that, he, that Israel is so desperately going to need, right? That we so desperately need. So God's not changing His mind when we, the way we think. His desire is to carry out His preordained plan through the mediator, through the intercessor of Moses. Okay? Sorry for the repetition. All right? Next. Moses begins to question Aaron now. All right, look at verse 21. And this is when it just gets funny. Moses says to Aaron, what did this people do to you? In, in layman's terms, what were you thinking, man? You should know better than this. What were you thinking leading this people to do this? And, 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 and Aaron's like, he's, he's got nothing to say, but excuse after excuse after excuse. This is what we do, right? When we're confronted with a lie, we're confronted with some wrongdoing, we want to Put it on somebody else. So Aaron responds to Moses' question with excuses. 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 Write that in your notes today. All kinds of excuses. Now there's some great confessors in the Bible. You know David wrote Psalm 51 uh, after he'd sinned with Bathsheba. He says, Lord, against you and you only have I sinned. I know I'm a sinner. The prodigal son comes running home to his father. says, I have sinned against you and against heaven. The tax collector is going to the temple and he's wailing and he's praying. He's pointing out, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then we also have some great excuse makers in the Bible. And it begins with the first guy. We didn't even have to get to another generation. Adam looks up into the heavens and says, Lord, it's this woman that you gave me. In the middle of Genesis chapter 3, we go into a whole section of the book of blame here, man. It says that he blamed the woman and he blamed God. He's been caught in his sin. And here comes the excuses. And then the woman, following the spiritual headship of her man, says, it's that slippery little serpent over there, you see. He tricked me. You remember King Saul and First Samuel 15, when they were supposed to wipe out that whole army and he kept the choice things for himself, he starts blaming the people. It's those people. It's the people. It's the people. It's the people. That's what I say when I go to my prayer closet. Like, Lord, I, you know I want to live for you, but those people. I got a few in particular that I remember my journey. What, what should have Aaron said here? All right, and this, is, this is what he should have done. Yeah. It's my fault. I'm sorry, Moses. It doesn't matter what they did to me. I was the one who led them into the sin. I was their spiritual leader. It was up to me to lead them to worship, true worship of the one true God. It's my fault. I did it. And I, I got it happen. They're out of control because of me. I'm sorry. Would you please forgive me? That's what he should have said. But what did he say? Look at verse 22. The first thing. Hey, back off. Don't let your anger burn against me. Don't get mad at me. You, you left me with these people. There it is again. Verse 22, the second half of the verse. These people that are prone to evil. You knew what you were leaving me with. You knew what I was getting into. And you left me alone with them. So if Moses, it's your fault. And it's the people's fault. And then comes maybe the most hilarious verse of Scripture. Verse 24, I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. <laughs> society calls this, our modern society calls this spin, right? What's God call it, church? Lie. It's a lie. It's a sin. It's not a spin, it's a sin. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? That's what it was. I'm, I'm waiting for other verses to come out for Aaron to say, our parents didn't love me like they loved you, Moses. <laughs> My wife doesn't respect me. Everybody else is demanding, and man, they're pressuring me. Have you felt the heat? You've been up there at a higher elevation with the presence of God. I'm down here in the valley, and the wind's not blowing. It's hot down here, and man, I'm struggling. Back off. I'm kind of waiting for those excuses. Boy, we don't have to look very far to realize that how much has changed. So what can we learn from all this? This is 
what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 2. He says, these things were written for our instruction. They were meant to be an example for us. The Lord allowed these circumstances to happen in order to teach us and to instruct us. We've learned and we've seen these ingredients for idolatry. But what do we take with us? What do we learn from this? How do we walk out that door today with this story in our mind? What, what, what do we pick out? First thing, sin is always lurking. Sin is always lurking. In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12 it says, Take heed lest you fall. And to pay attention, Christian. Pay attention. Because just when you think you're something, oh man, watch it. You're going to fall. What is that verse? It says pride comes before fall. Sin is always lurking. James 1 gives us this progression of sorts. He says that we are enticed. Oh, you can't blame the God for everything. You can't blame the devil for anything. We are enticed by our own lusts and our own passions. And when lust is conceived, that means in the heart and the mind, it gives birth to sin. That's the actual activity of it, right? And then when sin, when the activity is given birth, it gives birth to death, which is separation and disfellowship. Sin is always lurking. We learned from Aaron today, for the number two bullet point here, is that blame shifting and excuse making only minimizes our sin and further distances us from God. Get those words in there because, man, are they a part of our work or what? Blame shifting when you've been confronted in sin or excuse making. This is, it was funny because I'm not going to call them out or anything, it's not a name, but somebody <laughs> approached me right outside, right after this, walked out the door in the first service and said, I said, man, I miss you, I haven't seen you in a while. And they said, yeah, it's been really hard, uh, and, and uh, I've been been really worn out lately, and uh, my, my job has kept me all up, and, and, and they started listening. And I said, what are you doing right now? And they said, well, I'm talking, what are you doing right now? And they went, I'm making excuses. I said, you're not even three minutes removed from this and we're making excuses already. Your job says this. Your, 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 uh, your whole situation says this. Man, I'm not just preaching to you today. I'm going to preach you all the way in the parking lot <laughs> in your car today. <laughs> and then I'm going to get in the car and I'm going to move the mirror and go, yeah, all right. All right. <laughs> But this distance that we create when we do this, sin is a separator, right? And then when we are confronted with sin and we continue to lie about it or make excuses about it, what do we do? We're getting further and further and further from the truth. Further and further and further away from forgiveness and restoration. Saints of God, we can't be like that. Number three is that we compromise with the world and equals enmity with God. Opposition with God, enemies of God, and it invites judgment into our world. You've seen these ingredients of idolatry, doubt, restlessness, forgetfulness, disobedience, and pride. You've, we, we've seen these components and, and what's going on inside when, when everything is coming. But to compromise with the world, to listen to the world's life, and all that it could possibly bring to us, when we buy into that, we are also buying into separation from God. That's just the way it works. Apart from Christ, apart from the Word of God, apart from Christ, apart from the Holy Spirit's work in our life, we all live in the Romans 1 world, don't we? Desperately, desperately trying to satisfy our own lusts and our own passions. And they will not ever satisfy because they just can't. All too often, Christians try to deal with their rebellion, with their sin, with their idolatrous actions by putting them in the closet, sweeping them under the carpet. We practice this a little bit when we live in our the normal way that we live, and then the doorbell rings. And it's like all the oxygen is sucked out of the room. <gasps> the doorbell's wrong. Somebody's going to be coming in. And we fly around the house throwing things in the closet, sweeping things under the carpet, kicking the dog in the backyard, locking the kids in the bathroom, whatever. And then we open the door and go, welcome <laughs> to my humble abode. Yes. I'm sorry it looks like Country Living Magazine right now. It's just the way it always is. <laughs> I'm not getting on to you, baby. That's just the way we are. <laughs> That's Martha Stewart Jr. right there. If you want somebody to come to your house, she'll get it right. 
I knew you were the one that's kicked in the bathroom. And told me. <laughs> we try to throw things in the closet where people can't see, as if God can't see through that wooden door of yours. I was not to be tolerated, and they're not to be played around with. They're going to be totally disposed of. Don't put it in the closet. Don't sweep it around. Put it in the trash bag. Tie it up tight. And throw it in the dumpster. It needs to go away. It needs to go to the landfill. It needs to go to the place of annihilation and destruction. Don't mess around with the idols. What does God think about idolatry and all this rebellion that's going on? Just look outside the camp of Israel. Use your imaginations with me a little bit and look outside the camp. What happened to the idol? What happened to the, to the graven image? What happened to the golden calf? It was burned up, ground in powder, and put into their drinking source. The Bible doesn't tell us for how long, but when you get thirsty, you're going to drink. How many of you, when you're watching a movie or something, somebody stranded in the ocean, you're going, how can you be dying of thirst? Because that bitter, salty, brackish water will not satisfy. You know what happens when you drink? Bitterness like that? What was on the inside starts coming out, doesn't it? So when you look outside the camp and you see this violent retching going on, you see this refuse that's all over the outside of the camp, that's what God thinks of idols. Refuge. They come in, it gets digested, and it comes out. It's vomit. It's diarrhea in the Lord's eyes. It's outside the camp. What else does God think about it? You see all those humps, those little mounds in the sand outside the camp? Count them. There's 3,000 of them. Why 3,000? 3,000 of their brothers and their friends and their neighbors failed to repent. And they were destroyed on that day. Refuge, rotting corpses. That's what God thinks about idolatry. You can't mess around with this stuff. You don't want to mess around with God like that. You don't want to mess around with an idol like that. Be careful. I'm going to close with these two quotes. R.C. Sproul says this, The cow gave no love and demanded no obedience. It had no wrath, justice, or holiness to be feared. It was deaf, dumb, and impotent. But at least it could not intrude on their fun. <laughs> it could not call into judgment. Who wants a God that's going to call you to judgment? Who wants a God that's going to hurt your feelings? Who wants a God that's, that's going to allow things to happen in your life that you don't like? The God of the postmodern age is easy. He's all love and mercy. He's gentle. He's accepting of everything and everyone. That's the God of the postmodern age. Not the God of this book. Tim Chester, in his commentary, Exodus for You, he says, We live in a time when the church is full of compromises. Godly religion is being polluted by the values of our culture. I remember that saying, vultures of our culture. The word, the world is setting the agenda for the church, not the other way around. But we too, in our personal lives, face temptations to compromise. We tend to try to settle down somewhere in the gap between the standards of the gospel and the standards of the world. Exodus 32 is a call, a warning, and encouragement to rid ourselves of compromise. The question is, is where you settle in your death. Standards of the gospel, standards of the world. Are you trying to just make it through the muck and the mire in between? Pull a little from here, pull a little from there. It won't work. <coughs> won't work that way. Now, in the midst of the judgment, in the midst of the harshness, please don't just look at it and go, man, it's too hard. Look at it and see the grace in the middle of it. In verse 26, Moses stands and he says, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And the, there's always going to be consequence for sin. There's always going to be consequence. And that sin, as we saw before, leads to death. It leads to separation. The disfellowship, it always does. But in, even in the middle of that, the grace is 
There's an invitation to confess and repent and to be restored. And that's the invitation today. That's the call for you today. Wherever you've been, whatever you've been in the middle of, whatever muck and mire you've been stuck in, whatever idol has, has somehow found its way to top place in your heart and in your mind and in your life, hear the word of the Lord today. Fear His judgment and His wrath and then throw yourself on the grace. There is no other way. We should have sung that today. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to what? Trust and obey. There's nothing else that compares. There's nothing else that's better. There's nothing else that is a rival or a competitor with Him. Trust Him. Bow your heads with me today. And as you do so, hear those words of the, of the text ringing true in your mind. Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. The call for you today, the invitation for you today is to come and to confess what has been wrong. No more excuses. No more blame shifting. No more this distance between you and God. You want to abide in Him? Then you must confess and forsake and repent and return to Him. There's no other way. Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. The story today is the story of our own salvation. God is up on His holy mountain and we are down here on the earth, His footstool. And like the Israelites of old, we are floundering in the foolishness of our own rebellion and idolatry with God. Our idolatry, just like theirs, leads to immorality and distance from God. What we need is someone like Moses, don't we? We need a go-between. We need an intercessor. We need a mediator. We need someone to come down and intercede for someone who could turn away God's wrath from us. The message of the Gospel is here even in the middle of Exodus and that God has given us a mediator. Someone to intercede for us. When He saw our sin, He wanted to save us. So he sent his son, the great high priest, one who would sympathize with our weakness, one who has obtained the victory and now stands at the right hand of God, pleading and praying for us. Get you some of that. God says, Go down there, Jesus. Go down there for my people. The ones that I gave you from all eternity have become corrupt. They've prostituted themselves. They're living in sin. They've turned away from my law to worship and chase after other gods that won't satisfy them. Unless, unless you do something, unless you intercede for them, they will be destroyed by my wrath. I see this church. now that son broken and bloody hanging on the cross. And hear those words again. Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. Wherever you are, whatever you've been in the middle of, whatever you've chased after, whatever you have set up as first place in your life, throw yourself at the grace and the mercy of the cross and find forgiveness today. Nothing else compares. Nothing else is better. Nothing else will satisfy. Lord, that is our prayer today. That you would call some to yourself today. That your spirit would convict a heart or two or more. That Lord, you would restore to us the joy of your salvation as your people confess and repent. Thank you for grace and for the gospel and for salvation.